Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next installment of our Social Justice in College Athletics series. I'm Pat Manick, NACTA's Senior Executive Vice President, and I'm happy that you've joined us today to discuss this important topic in our industry. This afternoon's session, entitled The Economics of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, is a topic that has yet to be covered as part of this educational series. We've all heard that diversity, equity, and inclusion is good for business, and today's discussion will dive into exactly what that means. While educational programming and strategies to recruit, engage, and retain a diverse workforce are often heavily discussed, diversity and inclusion can also capture a more significant share of the consumer market and generate a competitive and enhanced economy. Our conversation will be led by MOA President China Jude, and we'll have the opportunity to hear perspectives and strategy from industry leaders on how DEI can enhance an organization's bottom dollar. We're joined today by Ross Bjork, Director of Athletics at Texas A&M University, Chris Kingston, Vice President for Multimedia Rights at Learfield IMG College, Corey Moss, Chief Executive Officer at the Collegiate Licensing Company, and Jovan Overshone, Senior Associate AD for External Affairs at Baylor University. Thank you all for being with us today. Before we begin, I would like to remind our live attendees joining us on Zoom that you can ask questions throughout the session using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will address as many questions as possible towards the end of today's discussion. Thank you again for joining us today. With that, China, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Pat. I really appreciate it. And welcome everyone. I'm very excited to uh, speak about a very important topic. Before we start, of course, I want to speak on behalf of the uh, entire panelists to send our uh, thoughts and prayers to the George Floyd family and all of the families who are impacted by uh, the violence that's happening uh, recently. And this is the reason why we are here. We're here to uh, continue to be engaged, to be educated, and how we can best address diversity, equity, inclusion, and I'll add the extra B, the belonging. Now, one of the things that's really important for me to convey is as we're moving along with having these discussions, I always say that there are about five steps when we're educating ourselves in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. The first one is awareness, making sure that we're all on the same page and something is happening in this world. The second step is education, which is that's where we're at currently. Third step is processes. Fourth step, which is a scary step, are policies, which shows accountability. And then the fifth step is profits. And that's where we're at at this particular time. We could talk about HR, we could talk about uh, education, but how do we incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion in everyday business practices? So I'm excited to assemble this wonderful all-star panelists together. And so let's go ahead and dive into it. Um, Ross, we're, we'll start with you. Ross, from your perspective, what does the economics of diversity, equity, and inclusion mean to you? Thanks, China. Thanks for moderating this. And uh, great to see all the esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, and Pat, thanks for the, the welcome and what NACT is doing uh, in this virtual setting. Let, let's get back to in-person conventions here pretty soon. Can we do that, please? Uh, so we can all have these talks in person. I, China, look, I, I think um, one of the things that we've learned um, in, in really just dealing with the last sort of 13 to 14 months is we've all now become uh, public health experts. We've uh, had to talk about legislative items. I'm, I'm actually, I have a, the state of Texas Senate hearing on name image likeness on my iPad um, over here to my left. Um, I'm not distracted, but it's on over here because that's brewing. And then we also have uh, social justice matters. And so we've all had to, I think, accelerate in many ways our, our learning curve. So what, when I hear the economic 
part of this conversation come into play when I you, you think about revenues and things that, that come into the athletic department? I really think about our communities. I think our jobs, I think our objectives are to make our athletic departments reflective of our communities. And hopefully that means that everyone is welcome, not just playing as a student athlete, but coming to games, attending our events, being a sponsor, being a donor, whatever it might be, we should be reflective of our communities. And in turn, right, the more people you have watching your games, the better your teams are, the more fan experience things that you have on the table, that will lead to just profit, if you will, right? Money making, whatever the term you want to use in college athletics. So I think when I hear this, when it's brought up, it's about how are we being really all things to all people, right? How is everything welcome? How do we have all the different price points to get into our venues, to come to our games, to, to be involved? How do we do that? How do we market that? How do we promote that? And so that's what I think of. We, we don't have all the answers by any means. I think we're all still learning in this environment. We're all seeing impacts that are happening around our country. And uh, we need to continue to have this topic uh, front and center for sure. So thanks for doing this. Thank you. Well, you know, and let's start there. You mentioned marketing. You mentioned marketing. Um, Javon, what are some of those marketing strategies or innovative strategies that you've used on your campus to uh, engage diverse uh, groups to attend your, your games, to, to be a part of campus activities? I appreciate that question. Um, you know, as Ross said, we we certainly don't profess to be the experts or to know all the things in this space. And each day we're growing. Um, but the way from from an institutional perspective, kind of how we talk internally here amongst my team is there's this this perceived and in some ways very real socioeconomic bubble. And you know, our work is to kind of pierce that bubble and to bridge that divide. Um, and so, a lot of the work that we do. You know, you might not immediately think of the economic impact, um, but it does long term. So we do a lot of initiatives that we're going out into the community. We're going in spaces that we normally wouldn't put, say, a billboard up, up in. We normally wouldn't have an event, um, you know, in the past may not have hosted events in. But we're trying to extend our arms into the community in ways that if we go out that they then come in. Um, we also have various initiatives. Um, we have some great partners on campus and external affairs and student activities. And um, one example is we had, we're trying to incentivize our student athletes and students across campus, for example, to, um, for, to regularly COVID test. Um, so one of the things that we did was there is this a voucher program where you test and you get this voucher um, credit towards, you know, food, um, a food truck on campus or Waco uh, area. Um, you know, uh, restaurants. And in that list, we specifically targeted minority um, businesses. So we've done some very intentional things. Uh, we, we have Culture Wealth Wednesdays on campus where we weekly highlight um, a minority business um, in our community. So we do a lot of outreach. And again, as Ross said, with the idea that that business then comes back, it goes both ways. Um, we just have to create some awareness. So it's an exciting space for us and time for us to be in. Yeah, yeah, let's let's did did uh, Corey, you look like you wanted to say something. I do, because I think what both Ross and Javon said like really speaks to the the money side of it. They both said about being in their communities and trying to be all things to everybody. Their their fan base, their customers are a very diverse group. And for us as a partner with both Baylor and Texas AM and as and as many uh, partners that we have. That, that's what they rely on us as a partner to do in the licensed product space for them, right? And so that's money. We have to be able to do that or if we're not, we don't, we don't maintain our partnership with Baylor and Texas A&M if they can't rely on us to do that. In order for us to do that, we have to understand that community. We have to, so it actually starts with us. So if, mm -hmm. if us, if CLC as a company is not committed ourselves to DEI and we don't have a diverse mix of staff, both race, 
sexual orientation, experience, thought, perspective, if we can't in some way relate to who their customers, their fans are, then we won't be in business with them. So that costs us money. So we have to be committed to DEI ourselves in order to further the commitment that the institutions have, but more importantly, speak to their fans. So I, I just think that's a, I mean, you said you wanted to keep this narrow and keep this about money. That's it right there. Yeah. Well, let, let's uh, chime Chris into this also, uh, Corey, because I know that since we are living in this COVID climate, <laughs> that um, we're going to have to go and find some new businesses, build some new relationships. Uh, I wanted to uh, share a story with you. Uh, I know when I was an athletic director at a small division two institution outside of Philadelphia, uh, one of the golf pros uh, came by to visit me and wanted to uh, reach out to creating golf initiatives on our campus. Uh, this, this golf uh, course was about three miles from us, less than three miles. We had no relationship with them. And we decided, uh, because we were an HBCU, we decided to get together to create a golf initiative at the university, which led to a number of initiatives right there on their course. They were an extended facility for banquets, student athlete banquets, other things like that. And it, it became very good for business for both of us. They extended themselves to tapping into HBCUs because it was a private course. We extended ourselves of new programming, new initiatives, golf outings. So money was happening on both sides. So Chris, what, what are your thoughts in regards to that of extending outside of uh, that comfort zone that you, you know, that your company may have? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, a great topic, great observation. I think, um, and Ross hit the nail on the head with, it's about the community and engaging the community. Um, you know, like Corey's talking about with where we have to be fan centric. Um, all of us, right? And so we have our school partners um, that, that we're very client first centric, but it has to be uh, centered on the fans. And I think we are able to bring our strategies together with the school partners and the corporate brands uh, to serve those fans. And I think one example I would give you is similar to, to yours uh, recently, uh, pre-COVID, New Mexico State we had the first ever Hispanic Heritage Day. And those, those have happened at uh, various schools, but really, really huge success story there for, for us and for everybody. And it was a huge connection um, to, you know, key segment of Las Cruces fan base, provided unique activations for our sponsors and, and our local businesses. An unbelievable engagement with the um, uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, we were able to leverage the excitement and the dollars from unique businesses and their marketing budgets um, for the first ever, you know, beer sponsorship at, at New Mexico State. And, and now we're in talks again with, with, with multiple partners in that space alone. Um, I can only imagine uh, the future seeds that that planted with fans uh, whether it's merchandise, whether it's ticketing, um, the, the licensing initiatives we did. Um, so it was a very holistic approach. And we we're able to tap into uh, the dollars that exist, not just someone's marketing budget. You know, folks have a philanthropic line, they have a marketing or a sponsorship line, and then they'll have some other line. They, you know, um, they, they, we were able to tap into dollars that were outside of a traditional sponsor budget, which was which was fantastic. So I think when we look around the community and you can combine strategically programs and partnerships, um, it's just simply, it, it is good for business. Yeah, you mentioned Chris um, about the, the Chamber of Commerce and I wanna go back to, to Ross and, and Javon about that. Uh, I know that a lot of individuals may be very familiar with NAACP, but there's so many other types of community organizations that focuses on the economic development, such as urban leagues, such as the various chamber of commerces, um, even tapping into some veteran affairs and, and uh, 
disabilities uh, organizations that that target persons with disabilities. So Ross, Javon, have you had that opportunity to build bridges with those type of non for profit organizations and agencies to help enhance uh, marketing to those underrepresented populations in your area? I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, you know, I think yes. It's a, it's a very, very simply yes. Um, and that's been that's been huge for us. Uh, you know, obviously there's an engagement piece of it, but we again, as we know, it's all tied, it's all tied to the dollars and cents. But specifically, you know, with the hiring of um, you know, our football coach, Coach Aranda, um, who is Mexican American heritage, um, that was an opportunity for us to again re-examine some of the things that we're doing. So as a result of that, we've tapped into um you know, some of our minority chamber associations the Hispanic um, chamber here, and we've created some opportunities to partner. Um, you know, we've also uh, other extensions of that chamber. We've, we've uh, as a campus, have contributed pretty heavily to the Central Texas Minority Business Equity Fund and created some, some partnership there. So, you know, it's, it's in some ways becoming woven into the fabric of who we are, not only as an athletic department, um, but as an institution, which has allowed it to be far more impactful, um, like Corey said, when it starts with every piece of what you do, um, it allows you to be more consistent in how you handle the topic. I think it's very similar, those kind of resources in our community, again, because we can't really do this alone because we're, we're not necessarily the experts. How do we bridge those gaps? I, I would say here at A&M, we're, we're not quite there yet. We're, we're learning these relationships, at least for me. I've, I've only been here less than two years um, and then 13 months in a bunker on, on Zoom. Um, but we have, we've been to chamber meetings. We've been to Boys and Girls Clubs. We, the Convention and Visitors Bureau is, is big in our cities. We have, we, have a, we have two cities. We have Bryan, Texas. And we have College Station. And Texas A&M is really in both cities. Um, and so building those relationships, building those bridges, being visible in our communities, I think is very, very important. And then our student athletes, <clears throat> our student athletes have done a great job. We have a blood drive uh, tomorrow that our women's basketball team is hosting, things like that. And that's what's neat about the student athlete piece is they can drive a lot of these ideas, which hopefully in turn builds a fan base. They come to games. Hey, I met so-and-so at the the blood drive and now I'm coming to the women's basketball game or I'm buying season tickets. Our student athletes can make these great connections through service and, and community outreach. So all of those things are, I think, part of the equation here. Well, I'm sure that your area is definitely going to grow bigger. I do want to let everyone know, if you don't know about Ross, he was our, our 2015 champion of diversity and inclusion for the NCAA. So uh, that oh, wow. was, uh, would be what, the six year anniversary, Ross, and uh, mm. you're doing great that was things. a long time ago. It Thank was, you. it was. I was the chair of the MOIC and uh, we felt very strongly about you and, and your president at that mm. time when you were at Ole Miss and we had nothing but confidence in you and growing in that. I appreciate um, let's, that. Let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, we mm. talked about businesses. And uh, I know that when I was the assistant vice president at Queens College, we, um, we really uh, did our best to recruit women in ethnic, uh, ethnic owned businesses, ethnic minority owned businesses to be a part of the procurement process. That was really important to make sure that they were involved and engaged. So of course we know that we're, we're accustomed to all of the companies that we're comfortable with but there were a lot of local businesses that we knew that could do some, some really good things. Uh, and they, uh, of course, they had to submit um, all of the appropriate paperwork to be considered a vendor. And then when it came to bids, specifically um, silent bids, uh, they were a part of the process, but we also gave extra points if they were owned by a woman in ethnic minority. So, Corey, what, what are your, your uh, strategies or perspectives that you have seen in some of the properties you've dealt with when it came to procurement? Yeah, I, 
And now Chris is going to talk maybe a little bit about some of the things that we do at Learfield because we have some some obviously our own buying power. But but I think you bring up a good point. We're a part of and responding to a lot of the procurement, the RFPs on on campuses and universities. And so it has a lot to do with, in my opinion, on how much are they going to weight the scale, the point system that evaluate companies that come in. I know at CLC, we're 65% women, we're 25% people of color. Those are things that we, you know, show, but it's, 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 it's more than that for us. It's not just the numbers. It's about the things that we do, the courageous conversations that we have about racial injustices, about social injustice, about microaggressions in the workplace, about violence against women, those things, the small groups have, the diversity disclosure um, database that we collect. So now that now our, uh, now our partners can see what their licensee and manufacturers make up of uh, minority companies um, are in that are doing their type of product. So those are the things that we talk about. Those are the things that we do. It's really about what is gonna ultimately happen in that procurement process when there's a financial uh, point system, there's a service point system, there's a diversity, equity, inclusion, commitment point system. What, how much points are you getting for those individual pieces and how much will that tip, tip the scale? And those are things that I think will, will, as we continue to move along, will become much more important from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint because the fan bases are so diverse. The things that institutions want their partners to do, they have to be able to relate to those things. And if they're not committed themselves, I think the point system needs to get more weighted average than maybe it's starting out right now, but that's a work in progress. But it's things that we're starting to see more of as we go through those processes. And I think they'll, they'll, be, uh, they'll continue to grow. Um, yeah, Chris, hey, 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 Chris, I, and I'll let you chime in. I think you'll get a kick out of it since we're one of your your properties that, you know, we have a barber. I oversee the barber shop here at Wyoming. And, you know, I had to go about 45 miles into Cheyenne to find a barber. And uh, fortunately, we found uh, some gentlemen who are ethnic minorities, extremely diverse barber shop, and they, they cut hair for the military. And we brought them in to take care of our student athletes. So of course, it was it was good for their business. I mean, they weren't the official barber of University of Wyoming, um, but they they cut our our football players and basketball players' hair. Um, it helped us because we wanted to make sure that we gave a great service for our student athletes. But driving that business to that barber shop really was helpful for them. What are, what are your thoughts in regards to the procurement process and recruiting businesses that are owned by women and ethnic minorities? Well, my, my, my first thought is um, they should be a partner. So Brad Poe, if you're listening, uh, China just gave you a lead. Um, <laughs> so um, I would tell you that, um, you know, the first thing, and, and obviously you, you, you recognized with the barbershop example, you know, you have to have a, 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 a DEI strategy. And, and I'm proud of what we've done at Learfield IMG College. We, we stood up a DEI task force. Um, we've introduced uh, some informal and now formal uh, training. Uh, we've, we've outsourced and we've really made a commitment. And I would say to everyone, every, every school, conference, university, everyone, I mean, there has to be a commitment to that budget to this, the whole DEI. Um, if it's just something we talk about a little bit, it'll 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 fade away. And I think we talked about it a little bit the other day. You know, a, um, a budget line item for DEI, and that will that will get you started, focused, and it's part of your strategic plan. So as a result, we do have uh, specific you know uh, supplier diversity goals, and um, we do uh, work hard. And one of our goals is the inclusion of diverse suppliers as part of sourcing in our procurement. Um, uh, we actively seek you know, certified uh, diverse suppliers in that process. And I, I think the, as I went through our strategy, the thing that really jumped out to me was that we, we also engage suppliers who are not currently certified. 
and we and we go down that path to help provide some advocacy education for a path to the certification process to become involved and and I think that's that's a, a pretty unique way to to uh, that, that we that we look at it and so all of that said um, I think it comes with a commitment from from the, from your respective leadership in the DEI space before you can even get to the barbershop. Like you have to recognize and you have to have strategies and goals. Um, so that's, I'm proud of what we're doing. And um, Brad Poe, you need to go call on that barber. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I will definitely make sure he get that information. Giovanni, you wanna jump in on that? Just a real quick note and something Chris said made me think about it. You know, I think, and I'll say this personally, you know, previously I had a, at one point, I had a very black and white kind of perspective on, you know, our relationship, our Learfield IMG, our multimedia rights relationship, and um, really trying to navigate and balance the ability to make sure that you are maintaining the value of these paid sponsorships and, and um, you know, but then you have this other side where you are still trying to create this, you're trying to do exactly this, you know, DEI, you're trying to ensure that you're creating an environment that is conducive to that. And there was a time where I really struggled with marrying the two, um, but and really credit to you know our partners at Learfield and you know our general manager here at our property because I think really part of it was having those conversations to like you said you're understanding and valuing what's important on your campus, what's important as a community, and really understanding what those barriers to entry are for those particular businesses and cre finding creative solutions or. Um, levels of entry so that you can foster that sponsorship, that partnership that you need. Um, and, and, and I think we've done that. And um, anyway, so that's something I'm just really proud of, just the ability for Learfield to come alongside us and be creative in that way, uh, because it can be something that's a little bit difficult to manage uh, and just processing how you're looking at that. And we also have to take into consideration, as I mentioned about the barbershop, this is not a, a big company. This is, you know, two guys that are licensed barbers, you know, and they, they opened a small business and are, and are doing well, especially working on the military side and now with us. And so we have to also take into consideration that there are many businesses that are just starting. And just as I use that example of that golf club pro coming to the small HBCU, and we came to an agreement and it, it turned into something wonderful. I do wanna uh, give out a plug to uh, my organization, the uh, Minority Opportunities Athletics Association. We are starting our Minority Economic Inclusion Network where we are identifying businesses um, and we're putting on our website, we have a, a system where we're gonna be putting businesses on our website that are owned by women and ethnic minorities. So if um, all of our NACTA affiliate members are looking for businesses to, um, to collaborate with or from a, a RFP perspective, um, we have that, that system that we're gonna make sure that we're gonna drive that economic growth to those businesses. I think it can really make a significant difference. Ross, did you want to chime in on anything? Oh, I'm sorry, Corey. No, so you brought up the, the Minority Enterprise uh, Network. And again, we're helping you out with that right now because yes. we have a disclosure database of those companies that have the potential to participate in that. Again, it goes back to our business's commitment to DEI prior to the business opportunity showing up. If we didn't have that in place, and when Stan Johnson calls me and says he's putting up this website to kind of get these companies out there, if we hadn't been committed to this years ago to try and have the ability to identify these companies, we couldn't participate. We couldn't help out. And so, again, that's where I'm saying that a company's commitment early on and often and always is going to be extremely important for them to get business opportunities moving forward. It has to happen. And Cora, we really appreciate your support on this. And we want to continue to grow with it because there are a lot of great businesses out there. Uh, we want to encourage um, that entrepreneurial spirit. We want to make sure that they're set up 
um, so they can continue to grow and make a significant impact. Because the economic growth makes a significant difference. Um, Ross, do you uh, want to chime in on this one before well, I switch gears? I was just going to say <clears throat> the part about the purchasing, and I think that's overlooked. Hey, let's write a diversity, equity, inclusion plan. And we always think about like our programming. What are we doing with our student athletes? What are we doing with our staff? And frankly, I'm, I'm writing notes down because I don't know what our procurement checklist is here at Texas a and I'm going to find out. But when we wrote our plan, we didn't have this in there. So I think it highlights that this is another layer that I think kind of goes overlooked in the whole process when we're talking about a holistic view. So I would say we're behind China at Texas A&M. Well, I, I, first of all, thank you very much. Maybe we have something. We maybe have something and I don't know about it, but it wasn't part of our plan when we Right. put all this together. And I'm glad you mentioned the plan, Ross. I, I've been reading a lot of plans as the MOA president. I've been mm -hmm. reading a lot of plans. I've been engaging a lot of people. And if you can remember what I mentioned earlier in this session, mm -hmm. I said that there are multiple stages, the awareness, the education, the processes, the policies, and then the profits. Yep. So Finance does make a significant difference. Um, it takes a little bit of time, especially if you're in a state system and you know you have to deal with those particular rules. But but uh, economic growth makes a significant difference also. And the more that we can help support those women and ethnic minority businesses, it can it can really um, uh, help us grow as an industry, especially when we're looking for new monies and new partnerships. I don't want to um, neglect mentioning uh, or mentioning about our LGBTQ plus community. There are many businesses for them, um, veteran affairs. We wanna make sure Asian Americans, there are so many organizations and agencies out there that want to be involved and engaged. We're forgetting about that there are trillions of dollars that are spent in the LGBTQ plus community, um, black and brown communities. I mean, uh, hair care products are, and beauty products are big in black and brown communities. Also, are we tapping into those type of businesses? So we have to kind of think outside of the box. But, you know, it got me thinking about, uh, and Corey, I'm gonna uh, jump in uh, have you jump in on this conversation. Here we go, Major League Baseball. They move from Atlanta to Denver. We're talking about $100 million that just left Atlanta <laughs> and now is going to Denver. Do you think that that's where we're gonna be at now that many organizations and businesses that are involved in social justice issues, that they're going to take their business somewhere else? I think there's there's the short answer is yes. I think it's highly it's very complicated though. Obviously, with CLC being being headquartered in Atlanta, I'm very familiar with what's what's happening here. And that as as a leader of an organization and a company here in Atlanta, my job is very hard. It's gotten a lot harder because there's this connection with political issues, social issues, everything. It's, it's interwoven into everything that we do, everything that's happening on campuses, happening with the student athletes who are leading a majority of the charges, not only in, in sports primarily. So all of that is connected, whether we like it or not. It just, it is and it will, and it's always gonna be. And so that makes us have to be, we have to work a lot harder, we have to be well-informed and we have to, to dig into these types of issues and really understand them and become highly educated on it. So again, that's a, there's a lot there, but I think the short answer is yes, those are things that we're gonna to continue to see. Chris, do you think that by speaking about uh, a political stance that that could hurt business? I think, um... I mean, I take it away from a political stance. I mean, we, we've kind of, with everything kind of 
in a delineated in a two party system. I put it in a, a right or wrong stance. And so, and I know, I mean, Jovan can speak to, we had an incident um, lately, just recently where we had to address something that was just wrong, right? And so um, I think you can, you can put it in, in, the, in the box of right or wrong. We recognize what's, what's not right um, and then make an adjustment. And that's where, this is where you get an opportunity to, to you know, walk the walk and, and, and really kind of say who you are or show who you are rather, um, and, and specifically when it affects business. Um, so we had it, you know, we had a, a, a sponsor, you know, slash donor misstep at Baylor and we had to take uh, action um, collectively and follow um, Baylor's lead, which we did, and ultimately suspended a relationship because of something that happened because it was right. And, and so I think that, I think if that's your litmus test, I, I think you'll be fine. Well, Javon, he mentioned you, so. Um, I, I don't know if you want to kind of describe what happened. <laughs> I had to go back and watch the video again. Um, you know, speak on that a little bit and how did that impact the immediate decision? And do you think that there's going to be a long term impact when it comes to your department as well as that, that uh, sponsor? Yeah, we've all had those days where we have a good night, we're celebrating, and then you just want the day to be normal when you wake up. Um, that wasn't the case. Uh, so, yes, we um, one of our one of our local partners. Um, you know, it's tradition uh, that you know you win a national championship. Our basketball program wins a national championship, and this um, partner basically gives a car to the head coach for a year. Um, to drive and, um, and we promoted accordingly. So in this particular instance, following the parade, a comment was made by this individual that completely misaligned with who we are as an institution, uh, more specifically, the culture of our athletic department. And, and especially when you look at our men's basketball team, the diversity of them, the culture of joy, and that's authentic. Um, and just who they are as far as just really wanting to create this environment where you just wrap your arms around everybody. Um, and the comments uh, was basically uh, referenced uh, recruiting people up out of the hood um, with this particular vehicle. And I'll have to say, this is one of those moments where I could not be more proud to be a part of Baylor because, um, and to have the partners that we do. And, and you know, Chris referenced that. And, this was a very clear and decisive move for us. It wasn't, we did not consider the fiscal piece of it. You know, of course I had all that data ready. Um, you know, when you're talking potential cumulative uh, six figure loss, I mean, that, that can be reason to consider it. But in this moment, as Chris said, it was just right or wrong. Um, now, what I'll say is being somebody that has a passion for branding as well, you know, when you think about um, brand value and brand integrity, something like this is not good. Um, and I'll tell you the response from the community, maybe, um, and internally, our internal constituents, you know, student athletes, um, faculty, staff, the response of it being, being in support of our quick decision making and seeing this very clearly as being inconsistent and wrong probably makes me more proud, of the, more proud than the decisive action we took as an athletic department. Because what that shows is progress, um, and I think it's it's difficult to know if you're really making change. It's difficult to know if you really are. You know, you can plan. You know, as Ross says, we've got a plan too. And just so you don't feel bad, we've got some work to do as well. <laughs> um, but you can plan all day long. You can say what you're going to do, but it's in the moment um, that really shows who you are. And you know, this hasn't been pleasant for this individual um, or his business. Uh, you know this made national news. This wasn't localized. Um, and there have been some unpleasant comments made, you know, social, it's very easy to, to voice your concerns. And um, he has extended uh, what seems like a very sincere apology. Um, and that's why Chris says it's a suspension. You know, there is the hope that there's opportunity for education and, you know, uh, kind of reform in this space. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not positive. Uh, so obviously there's a fiscal impact to us which is secondary, um, our student athletes, showing them what's right, 
um, what's wrong matters. Um, but then there's also obviously impact to his business. And um, we can see and we know just from conversations that he's definitely remorseful. So. Yeah, I just want to I just want to I just want to add and, and say, like, one of the things you asked China was, what would it, will it have long term impacts? And I don't know if you were asking that in context of negative or positive, like from a financial perspective. But I hope it has a long term you know, impact because of all the things Jovan just said is like we showed collectively the student athletes what the right answer was, the community what the right answers are, other business partners. Someone might disagree. There's and, and collectively, I, it, we believe that we did the right thing. And and I do I do think there's a catalyst for the positive, which is education, whether it's that business, whether other businesses recognize they need DEI education, there is a positive movement that will come from this. It's a, it's not a cancel culture type of thing. It was, there's right and there's wrong. And, and it was, it was not hard it, when you have, when you allow just your character and integrity to guide you on this, which, you know, Mac and Jovan, if, you know, following their lead that I'm thankful for, it was easy. Um, not m maybe a little bit painful, but that the right thing prevailed. And so I, I do hope it has a long-term impact on, on how everyone looks at what was right. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Ross, I'm gonna ask you this last question and then we're going to take questions uh, from our viewers. So Ross, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. I know at Wyoming, uh, we put out a, a poster, a Black Lives Matter poster. And um, we got we got some comments, some strong comments. We mm -hmm. did. Uh, fortunately, my athletic director stood firm <laughs> on it and um, but but did a great job of managing donors, managing, you know, some community members. Have you ran into any issues in terms of Black Lives Matter? Uh, financially with sponsors or donors? We, we really, what we did is we put all this in front of our student athletes and had all these conversations about, about patches, about slogans, about t-shirts, whatever the displays were going to be, right? Because all that was coming down at the, really at the same time, kind of that July and August period. What are we going to have on our uniform? What's our slogan going to be? And actually, it really became organic because we had a we had a march with our student athletes in the community and it, they called it a unity march. So unity became our theme. And so the way we approached it is we said, if that if that's the mission. Then what type of sayings are out there that bring people together, not pull people apart, because frankly, in our community, the term Black Lives Matter was polarizing because people didn't understand, is there a difference between the movement and the organization? And people weren't decoupling those things. The movement, absolutely. We have a train track that runs by my office, so I may have a noise here in a second. That's College Station, that's how College Station was named, train station, college town. Uh, so I may have to mute here in a second. But we really, we said, student athletes, you guys analyze this, take the perspective of talking to everybody, not just the black community, not the white community, not the brown. Let's talk to everybody and come up. And so unity became unified and that became our patch. That became our, our saying. And, and the student athletes took the lead on. I, I remember sitting in a football team meeting and you had white student athletes, you had black student athletes. The black student athletes said, hey guys, should we have Black Lives Matter on, on a patch? Because what if that makes somebody mad? Hey, let's talk it through. And they, they came up with beat the hell out of racism. Beat the hell out of Baylor. Beat the hell out of Texas, Alabama, Florida. That's a saying that Texas A&M uses. We're going to beat the hell out of whoever. So they came up with beat the hell out of racism. That was their patch. So really for us, it was organic through our student athletes. And that, that's how we approached it. We did have pushback. We had athletes kneel during the national anthem. We had people ask for their money back. We had, we gave that money back. They wanted refunds. 
So there, there was that fallout piece that we did have around certain things, but, but we tried to make it about the student athletes and, and that unity piece. That's great. I appreciate that. I like the beat the hell out of, I like that. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and take some questions. Katie. Thank you, China. So again, just a reminder to folks, um, and you probably saw this in your chat feature, but if you do have a question for the panel, please feel free to enter that into the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. Our first question, China, states, how do you respond to the feedback that if you go after diverse suppliers, the other non-diverse businesses are left out or discriminated against? Corey, Chris, you wanna jump on that? Yeah, I'll uh, I I'll open and then I'll I'll kick it to Corey. I, I don't. There's no intent to leave anyone out. It's the uh, you know DEI. There's, it's inclusion, and so it's it's including people and not leaving anyone out. Um, I think it's an it's an effort to recognize the diversity that exists and and include it. Um, so. Look, at the end of the day, just like in your, on your campuses in the state system by this, whoever asked that question, um, you know, you're going to go through an RFP system and maybe it's the best and final, lowest, whatever, whatever happens in your respective procurement, but including everyone is, is only good. And um, I'll, I'll let Corey talk, talk a little bit about that. Um, and I've heard him talk about before on, you know, you, you can't get there if you don't, if you don't have it in the process. Yeah, I mean, not a whole lot to add to what to what Chris said, but it's also about having the right companies that can relate to all of the things that are needed. We just talked about, I mean, Ross and Javon said it earlier about the communities that they're trying to reach and touch that are a part of them. And so you have to have companies that can relate to that. This is a this is a relationship business. And so if you don't have companies that understand the needs and the wants of those very distinct and diverse groups and understand where they are, how can you market and engage in the types of products that they want? If, if, a, if a company just has one type of view and that's all they can really speak to, then those aren't the op other opportunities are not gonna be for them. And so it's about having that diverse mix of companies because we're gonna have a diverse mix of opportunities. Yeah, and I think that that's the reason why I mentioned about the Chamber of Commerce is, you know, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you know, Black Chamber of Commerce, Urban Leagues, all of those type of organizations that can help connect with other companies. And so at least when information is, is going out, everyone is included, as Chris mentioned, it's about the inclusion of it. So hey, the, the, only, the only other thing I'll say, too, is like if you if you don't have a diverse hiring pool or you don't have a diverse group in your RFP process, then you won't make a diverse hire or you won't have diversity in your procurement. And so the only way to ensure that you do is to have, you're gonna hire the best person, you're gonna, you're gonna hire the best company supplier to fit your organization, but you, you have to be inclusive. Yeah, definitely. And think about the people that are, that think about the people that are, leading organizations you know i always talk about like if this is just about doing the right thing or being a good human being it's just not gonna last we see it every day people don't want to do the right thing all the time there aren't great human beings all the time so that stuff has the ability to not last again you're you've narrowed this topic china to to the economics that's the part that makes dei last right. if we don't have people in our organization that can relate to whether it's athletic administrators at our partners across the campus. If we don't have people that can, can relate to the diverse people that are in those positions these days, and that is gonna continue, then how are we gonna have a relationship with them if we can't relate to them? The, the, the head of sponsorships at brands across the country, those aren't gonna be the same type of person all the time, they're gonna control some money bags, right? And if we can't relate to them, then we're not gonna be able to attract their dollars because we don't understand where they may come from, their perspectives, their personalities, all of those things. So that's why DEI becomes so important to businesses and why it does help. And then if, if a business can't get behind it, behind it, I always talk about 
why should individuals get behind it? No matter what race, sexual orientation, whatever you may be, why should you get behind it? Because you're going to have people that report to you that are different. You're going to report to people that are different. If you're going to want to have a successful and professional career, you're going to have to relate to a lot of people. And if you're not committed yourself to DEI and understanding different people, how can you manage people? How can you understand your, your bosses that you report to? How are you going to understand the, the people that you're asking money from? So there's, a, there's also that, that money of a business, but that money of your own personal brand that DEI is important to you individually and to your company, because that's the only thing that will sustain it. I appreciate that. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Katie. Sure. So the next question um, states, have discussions and or educational sessions taken place with your student athletes about this topic and how it might impact their NIL pursuits? Ross, you want to jump on that first? We've had lots of conversations with our student athletes, um, not necessarily about the NIL pursuits as it relates to all of this. One, we don't know exactly how NIL is going to work. I got to find out what Texas decided on if they if they voted on it or not, and Jovan. So we'll have to adapt to that. Um, we don't know how partners are going to really activate this, um, but I, I do think that it's our obligation to teach them about brand awareness and about their personal branding and and who do they want to be, who do they want to portray themselves as in order to attract whatever that agreement might uh, might come about. So I, I think the education piece is definitely on us to provide that for our student athletes. Javon? Yeah, no, I, very similar. We, we've we had pretty extensive training for student athletes and our staff and continued training. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say there's been, there have been some maybe informal conversations, not specific to um, NIL, mm -hmm. but, but they are very much kind of, um, to some degree, brand centered. And I think a lot of the conversation has been I even had it with um, uh, my football creative staff, um, you know, last year when all this was coming on and some similar conversations have happened with some student athletes where it can be, it's, it's a very heated topic. It's difficult to understand. Like you say, when you bring up the Black Lives Matter and there's posters and those posters being just in a pan, uh, you know, in a video create an uproar. Um, it can be difficult to, to process the why uh, behind that up outcry. And so a lot of the conversations have been centered around kind of how I presented is so that phrase, is, as Ross said, has is polarizing to some because of, you know, the misperception of what the meaning is, or, you know, like you said, the, the actual entity or the actual idea of black lives mattering. Um, so, in some situations, it's from it's how we how we position the, the the video, how we position the piece, how we position the dialogue. Of I've said, you know, when we lead, when you lead off, for example, very specifically, like in a thirty second video, and the first thing you see is a poster with Black Lives Matter, you lose the opportunity for change. You lose the opportunity to engage in a dialogue that needs to happen because you've elicited feelings of you know of, of outrage in some. So for me, it's more of you've got to tell the story leading up to that. And if you are really doing a good job of all the pieces, educating, um, showing, um, living it out, um, you're creating, you know, images, like you said, unity, your words like that. If you are really painting that picture leading up to maybe a flash of a sign like that or someone having a shirt on it, you have better opportunity than when you lead with that branding. Um, so I think it's it's kind of helping to understand just how the pieces weave together. And I think that will to some degree, and you know, that could impact NIL, but not specifically. No, we haven't had those conversations. Can we squeeze out one more, Katie? One last one? Sure, China. So this next question states, how do you balance the perceptions and feelings of student athletes and staff members with the actions of DE&I plans to ensure your decision-making is organic and not solely for political correctness and revenue. Ross? <clears throat> to me, it, it just comes down to communication. Honestly, get everybody in a room, get everybody on Zoom, whatever the platform is, and talk these things out. 
you have to talk these things out. I mean, there, and I, I wasn't in all of them. I mean, our staff did an unbelievable job. Our coaches did an unbelievable job of hosting sessions with our student athletes and allowing them to talk. And I think that that's one of the quickest things that I learned when all of this, this really got magnified was people just want space to talk. So I think it just, it comes down to communication and then develop an action plan, communicate that action plan. I got an email from somebody uh, today that says, uh, I heard we're creating a, a black student athlete hall of fame at Texas A&M. That's not true. Right. So he has a vacuum of information where he doesn't have all the information. Now, what we are going to do is we're going to highlight black achievement of our student athletes. And we're going to highlight the first black student athletes in each sport because that hasn't been done before. We are going to do that piece of it. And so I think it just comes down to communication and putting everybody in the same room. And, and ha if you have to hash it out and argue and debate, OK, fine. But communicate and then communicate what the plan is. Awesome. Ross, Chris, Jovan, Corey. Corey, you, you have a closing remark? No. I, well, yes. Yes, I do. Um, and, and as you can tell, I'm passionate about it. I, we talk about this all the time. We, we want to be a great company. And great companies grow. This is, DEI is not about taking opportunities away from people. It's about creating more opportunities. So with DEI, our commitment to it, I just talked about the business reasons that we're going to be able to have better partnerships, more partnerships, more money will come into the company, we will grow and we will create new opportunities. DEI is helpful in that. So this is not about taking away opportunities, this is about creating more. We're gonna hire more people. We're gonna have more office space. We're gonna do all these things that are gonna help create more opportunities, not take away opportunities from anybody that currently exists. I really appreciate those closing remarks. Thank you very, very much. This is great conversation. I hope um, our viewers can take away at least one strategy to go back to their departments or organizations and kind of rethink that diversity plan to include the, the business side of it. Uh, so thank you again. Pat? Yeah, thank you, China. Um, you are a superstar moderating these. So many thanks to you for leading the charge on this. And thank you to our panelists, Jovan and Corey and Chris and Ross for your time and insights today. Some, some awesome information that was shared. And uh, just a couple of quick takeaways that I had uh, that I had jotted down. Um, I thought it was great hearing combine campus programs with community partnerships. I thought that was really neat. Um, obviously love the two examples, the one of the barbershop example at Wyoming that China shared as well as the, the car dealership one um, at Baylor. So thank you both for sharing that. And then the last one that I had written down was procure, procurement plans must include DEI research. I think that's vital. And I think that was really good. So once again, thank you to, to our moderator, China, and our panelists. And thank you all for joining us today. And as Ross stated in the very beginning, let's get back to having these meetings in person very soon. So in the meantime, take care and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, China. Great job. Thank you.